Today on The Roundhouse, we are talking about the Railroaders Memorial Museum in Altoona, Pennsylvania. All aboard! In days past, the Roundhouse was where the railroad worker united with the steam locomotive, each to prepare for the journey ahead. Today, it's where we examine the history, the industry, the machines, the hobby, and the passion behind railroading. News, interviews, stories, and more. So climb aboard. This is The Roundhouse. Welcome to The Roundhouse. I'm your host, Nick Ozarak, and this is episode number 97 of our Trains and Railroading podcast, where we're talking about everything in the industry and the hobby, you name it. We discuss it today. We are talking to Joe DeFrancesco. He is the executive director for the Railroaders Memorial Museum in Altoona, Pennsylvania. They are also involved with the world-famous Horseshoe Curve, which you've probably heard of, even if you've never been to Pennsylvania. And we are talking about the legacy of the PRR, its workers, the museum that is in place to honor that legacy, and Pennsylvania Railroad K4, number 1361, a steam locomotive restoration that a lot of you are anticipating. So we talk about all of that. Before we get to that, I want to thank the sponsor for today's episode, Age of Steam Roundhouse. They are hosting tours of their Sugar Creek, Ohio facility in 2020. You can visit their website at ageofsteamroundhouse.org. Our guest today is the executive director at the Railroaders Memorial Museum in Altoona, Pennsylvania, which is also involved with the famous Horseshoe Curve. Please welcome to the Roundhouse, Mr. Joe DeFrancesco. Hi, Nick. Thanks for having me. It's good to have you on the show, Joe. I've been going to your museum for many years now, and I'm sure many of our listeners have had a chance to visit. But for those who haven't, how would you describe... The museum? Sure. It's really unique in a sense of it's not so much about the artifacts, it's about the people. It's about the railroaders who uh, built Railroad City, also known as Altoona, and their accomplishments and the culture and the heritage that surround the work. And we utilize artifacts to tell a story, the human connection, the human element. So those who have never been here. I think we'll we'll be able to distinctly say it's much different than other museums, other history museums. Is we focus more on the stories that are being told uh, that keep our heritage alive. If you come to the museum, you will learn about apprentices. You will learn about social clubs. You will learn about ethnic neighborhoods in the city from the immigrants who came to work for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, going back all the way to the uh, early uh, 1850s, 18, late 1840s with the development of the system post uh, Pennsylvania Canal era. So Altoona has a rich history in the sense of it's just not railroading, it's the cultures that, that and the heritage that came with the immigrants. Uh, Altoona was a boom town from the late 1800s through really the 19 teens and flourished into the 1920s and uh, peaked in the 1940s. And that is really symbolic of the steam era where the primitive steam locomotives built by Baldwin were not cutting it, so to speak, when it came to the development of the horseshoe curve and the terrain of the middle route, the middle division. And Altoona became the base of operation. And as time went on rapidly, might I say, the need for bigger, more powerful locomotives came about and Altoona became a not only a repair facility but a building and construction facility and the yard complex that evolved around that so it became really a a large railroading capital of of the northeast at that time when people think of a railroad museum i think the image that often comes to mind is one where the emphasis might be on the static equipment that's sitting on a display track or in a yard setting or so forth. 
what's impressive about yours is how much attention is given to the interior displays because you do have the equipment to display, but you also have so much going on inside your multi-story building, which is a really impressive structure in itself, as well as how it's been repurposed to serve as a museum. Right. Our interpretive center is housed within the former Pennsylvania Railroad Master Mechanics Office Building, which was built in 1882. It housed shop storage, shop offices for the Altoona machine shops and later the Altoona works. Uh, This building was used for multiple purposes throughout its history and anything from middle division headquarters for the PRR dispatching during the Penn Central era to a medical examination office off of the 12th Street Bridge, which is very iconic for for local Altoonians who remember finally walking across that big bridge with the steam engines running underneath it. And uniquely with the medical examiner's office on the second floor, uh, that is where new hires were given their examinations or medical examinations or physicals. And they also treated, uh, you know, basic uh, first aid type, you know, injuries. And uh, also if it was more serious, they would come here and then be sent to the Altoona hospital for, for treatment. The building itself is so unique in architecture and iconic. And it's, I believe it's one of the few, uh, perfect examples of PRR architecture when it comes to office buildings. And we're just so blessed to have it uh, be our interpretive center. And where you walk in the lobby, you see a life-sized replica of the K4-1361 in its pre-war configuration. You see a model of Spruce Tower from Spruce Creek and Interlocking Tower. You have a scene going on with uh, workers building um, a boiler vertically uh, being suspended. And now it's all compressed and partial castings, not full replicas, but it gives you a, a sense of the, the drama that took place at that time, the, the appearance, the environment. And even with our lobby, it's interactive. Uh, everything about this museum is interactive, and that's what really sets it apart from a static museum. There's push buttons, there's audio visual that's triggered by motion, and it's really a submersive museum to where you're you're not, I don't think you'd go bored uh, in a traditional setting, uh, you know, with uh, the static exhibits. You, 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 push some, you push a button and something comes to life, it either talks to you or moves. Uh, or there's push screens where you, or touch screens where you can uh, interact with, with the various hands-on activities. So this museum really hits on all the senses, uh, and that, that's what really sets us apart from from other museums. I love the use of video. As a video guy myself and a firm believer in the power of it, I think about one of your exhibits where you're in this tavern and you're hearing actors portraying workers talking about the different neighborhoods and the different ethnicities that had moved into the area and the ways they do or don't get together and accidents that happen on the railroad. And it does make it real. And especially how it brings out the railroader. I mean, it's in your name as a museum, but the fact that you are working so diligently to bring out the story of the people, which can often get lost behind the impressive machines. Absolutely. And, and actually, uh, Kelly's Bar exhibit, that is one of my favorite exhibits. And I remember um, coming through here when the museum first opened around 1998. And that was so, it's so interesting. You walk into a mock-up of a bar and the lights dim. It has the little tile, uh, uh, you know, floor uh, replicate. It has a tin ceiling. It has... uh, the suspended lighting all from the period from like 1925 and you can sit at the bar, which is an actual bar that was repurposed from one that was being demolished and it was saved and, and then cut down and installed. And you would never know. It looks so accurate for, for a bar of that time. And it says, come on in and the lights dim. So, you know, it's very inviting. You come in like a bar and you sit there and what should be mirrors reflecting back like in a typical bar setting, 
their television screens. And, and as you were saying, it's the guys sitting at the bar, they're bantering back and forth. They're talking about stories. They're talking about, you know, what happened on the railroad that day. And one story comes to mind that I'll, I'll share with all of you is an accident that was unfortunately very, very common in the yards before radios and before modern technology with communication is they would have whistles to signal the movements and backings of trains and yards where they're making up the trains or breaking trains apart. And something happened that the, uh, the, the brakeman was down getting the trains connected and he went to go between the cars to couple them up and the wrong signal was given and he was between the couplers and the train back together. And the story goes that he was held alive enough by the sheer force of the train being together um, that there was time for his, his wife to be called, the priest to be called, and they said their goodbyes and the priest gave him his last rites and they had to uncouple the train because that's just, you know, that's just, they had to get on with it. And you could see, yes, these are actors portraying this out, but they are so in character that you can see how remorseful they were that that happened. But uh, oddly enough, my family on well, my father's side is, is from here in Altoona and they immigrated from Italy in the early 1900s to come work for the railroad. And there was a relative of mine at that time period. Now, I don't think it was the same person, but it, it happened to someone in my family as well. So pinching was very common at that time when, when railroading was, it's always been dangerous, but when it's been really, you know, really dangerous before technology. And uh, it, it kind of brings to light the, the true reality of railroading and how important it is to practice safety at all times. That is an important lesson where even where modern railroading has improved dramatically on the safety front, that it is still a matter of working with these very heavy, dangerous machines and the respect that that commands even to this day and the attention that it can bring to the continued innovation of the railroads to improve that safety for its workers. Right. And you will see that throughout the museum, we have an example of the old Lincoln pin setup versus a knuckle coupler. And, and that tells the story of, of that innovation with, with how the railroad progressed uh, with, you know, the air invention of the air brake with Westinghouse and uh, how the Pennsylvania railroad and other railroads invested in that early out of safety and efficiency. Um, when you're at the museum, there's a place where you start with the canal era and it shows the various routes that were being evaluated for the chartering of the railroad in 1846. And with J. Edgar Thompson uh, selecting the middle route, uh, known as the middle division, uh, from Lewistown to, to Altoona and over the Johnstown into Pittsburgh, that is what put Altoona into existence was that decision to use this route. At that time, Altoona was a wilderness. There was nobody here except for a few settlers and the nearest populations were Tyrone and Hollidaysburg. And Altoona quickly became a railroad town from the Roberson farm um, to Railroad City. And this valley became filled with soot and cinders, bustling, Whistles, activities, bustling downtown, theaters, the Logan House, which was one of the most unique, it has a most unique story and sadly is often overshadowed in, in the history books. The Logan House was one of the uh, PRR hotels that was constructed adjacent to the Altoona train station, late 1850s. During the Civil War, in secret, the loyal war governors met at the Logan House undercover to discuss whether or not they were going to support Abraham Lincoln in his effort to preserve the Union. They discussed the Emancipation Proclamation, and as a result of that meeting, the Union governors formed the Union behind Lincoln. 
and that happened right here in Altoona. Unfortunately, in 1923, the hotel was torn down. It was just at that point, the railroad was getting out of the hotel business. And progress. Sam Ray was president of the PRR, and he wanted to expand electrification past Harrisburg into the middle division to Altoona. Plans were made for that electrification, and that called for a new train station with high-level platforms, a new engine facility at Mill Run, adjacent uh, to the end of of Altoona here, near Alto Tower, um, just west of it. And that was going to be the cutoff point for electrification. However, that never happened. The hotel was torn down to make room for that, but that never came to fruition. So later the U.S. Post Office bought the land and built the modern day post office that we all know that's downtown that's still in use um, to this day. So that's that's the sad history of the Logan House. We do have relics. We have baggage checks. We do have um, multiple artifacts, but it's just the mere shadow of, of of how important that location was at one time. But it all happened here in Altoona because of the railroad. And that's just, it's just real, it's just one example of how relevant Altoona was to American history. What was the catalyst for the founding of the museum? In 1972, uh, the museum was found, and that was a direct, direct result of a grassroots effort that came in the late 60s at the end of the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad era. In 1968, in Altoona, there wasn't much in terms of preservation of railroad history. The National Railway Historical Society had been in existence for quite some time, and locals got together, train enthusiasts got together to form the Altoona Railway Museum Club. From that, it formed an NRHS chapter called the Horseshoe Curve Chapter of the National Railway Historical Society. In 1968, that was also around the same time the the Commonwealth was looking to create a state railroad museum. Altoona was in the run for becoming the site of that museum, and uh, it didn't work out that way. It it wound up going to to Strasburg, where, where we all flocked to to see the magnificent steam locomotives that were built in Altoona or maintained in Altoona. And as a result of that, it was a big hit to to the city in terms of, of, of its history. So from that group and, and the Chamber of Commerce formed a committee to create an Altoona Museum. And from 68 to 72, they formed the Railroaders Memorial Museum. And about eight years after that, in 1980, they raised the capital and the money and they created the original museum, which is still on uh, site here today. The original museum opened in 1980, September of 1980, and it was a place for local railroad collectors to display their items and to promote the story of the railroader. And it was a tribute to to uh, many of, of the workers at the time and, and their ancestors that built this town and and helped build the Pennsylvania Railroad. So from 1980 until about 1995, the museum was was in a building and it quickly outgrew it. The Master Mechanics Building, which is now our modern day museum, sat vacant. It had been vacant by the railroad for about 20 years by the time 1995 came around. And it had become a glorified pigeon coop because of the windows being knocked out, the building being abandoned. Local leaders and the museum administration at the time got together to fundraise and renovate this building and turn into a multi-million dollar facility that, that when it opened, even to this day, it's breathtaking. And it helped fulfill the mission even greater than the original building. From the Horseshoe Curve chapter and the community spirit and the grassroots effort led to the creation of this museum as a result of of Altoona not becoming the Commonwealth site for the State Railroad Museum. In 
Age of Steam Roundhouse, a true treasure of railroad preservation, is back for its second public season. This is a brand new roundhouse with nearly two dozen steam locomotives on display in Sugar Creek, Ohio. The facility features an 18-stall, accurately reconstructed brick roundhouse surrounding a 115-foot turntable, the largest private collection of steam locomotives in the world, and a fully functioning, working back shop where skilled staff actively restore and repair steam locomotives. The railroad is open for tours this summer and fall and is taking all necessary precautions to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Tours of the roundhouse and shop area will be offered Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, July through October. Tickets must be purchased in advance on their website at ageofsteamroundhouse.org. If you haven't seen it yet, visit ageofsteamroundhouse.org and follow them on social media. We were talking about some of the impressive interior displays that have been created over the years. What has made those possible? Is it having the right volunteers with the right skills, good grant writing? What has made that feasible? When the Master Mechanics Building was renovated, the, the fundraising campaign was was concentrated. It was it was a comprehensive uh, overall plan, not only to renovate and save the building, but also to design, fabricate, and install uh, the exhibits. And a lot of the exhibits were were built off site in, uh, believe it or not, studios. Uh, and all the inspiration, all of the content was provided by a committee here at the museum with our former director and former curatorial staff that really got a good solid group of, of local historians together and worked with outside vendors and contractors to develop the storyline. That's how they in- integrated artifacts with the stories, with the storyboards produced by uh, an oral history project uh, that was done in the early 90s, created all of this content from from individuals. And that's how we were able to to open our doors as a museum about the people, the, the railroaders, and and do it so comprehensively was really to the efforts of, of the museum in the 80s and 90s, um, pulling it all together and doing all the fundamental legwork and then producing it into a tangible um, uh, exhibit. Really, the talent goes into the vision of our curatorial team. At the time, it was led by Cummins McNitt, who was our former curator. His staff at the time was just phenomenal. He he was able to to capture the human story like like it was never told, you know, like like you never seen before. On top of that, you have all of this really nice equipment as far as demonstrating the range of Pennsylvania Railroad rolling stock in your outdoor grounds. You've got a GG1, you've got multiple different types of observation cars, B60B baggage, a crane, all of this stuff. How did that collection grow? Also in the 80s and and 90s uh, with Conrail. Conrail was very supportive of the USAM and was very friendly. And through through their connections, uh, you know, 1980s, 1990s, there were still a lot of passenger cars out there that were in maintenance of way uh, service or, or relatively retired, you know, soon thereafter. So Conrail was able to, to offer up some, some of the goodies, so to speak. And uh, I, I will highlight some of the, the, the interesting pieces. The B60 baggage car uh, was, was maintenance away. The RPO, the Robert E. Hannigan, the only named post office car that was in service in the Broadway Limited was in maintenance away service. That's one site. Uh, we have another RPO car that's used as a tool car in the 80s. Uh, it was used as a tool car for the K4 uh, operations. We have a heavyweight solarium observation car called the Union League Club. And that car is a diamond in the rough right now because its history is so significant for the club that it represents. The Union League Club was formed uh, right in about the Civil War with Republican businessmen and 
and influential Republicans created the Union League Club out of honor to Abraham Lincoln and and the efforts of the Civil War. And that car's namesake is really historic, and the club is still in existence. So that history of as many of the heavyweight cars and equipment that it's it's the namesakes, and there's always a story to be told by by their connections. Uh, we have the Mountain View, which was built in 1949 for the Broadway Limited. It's in, it's the best, it's it's our best example right now in terms of, of passenger equipment. It's its condition is is very good um, for a static display as it was restored in the 80s and last operated in the 90s on Amtrak. So it's in very good shape and it's stored indoors in a roundhouse here. That was an acquisition later on, not through not through the railroad. Uh, Conrail helped us get the uh, wreck derrick. Uh, it was an Elkhart derrick, originally New York Central piece, and that's a prime example of something that was acquired through Penn Central and, and later Conrail. Uh, it is an operating condition. It's stored on our siding right now, but it's it's something we, we intend to get to uh, at some point in the near future to do the cosmetics on it. Uh, we have a GG1 that came to the museum with the help of the Horseshoe Curve chapter and a dedicated uh, individual who, who sought that it's that would be preserved, uh, Andrea Vivert. She helped save it uh, with the museum and the, and the chapter's help. Uh, and it came to us, uh, I believe, through through Conrail and uh, maybe Amtrak, because uh, you know how some GG1s were split between uh, Conrail and Amtrak at that time, and uh, it it came to us during that time in, in early 80s when it was retired. Uh, we have the Loretto. The Loretto was Charles Schwab, the president of Bethlehem Steel. That was his private car. It was built in 1917 by Pullman. It's ornate. It's it's beautiful, full you know of the Gilded Age, but unfortunately. In the 80s, it was vandalized, and a portion of it was was uh, destroyed by fire. So we're working on a plan to get that restored um, and uh, working with uh, a local university to actually adjacent to the original Schwab estate in Loretto, PA, to create a satellite museum in his, in his honor and get the car up there and preserved next to, next to his estate. But that's that's being worked on now. So... You look at the collection, it it came in and it's all aging together. So you, it, we're not unlike many museums that we have rolling stock that, that needs a lot of TLC. And we, we do the best we can and with minimum resources. It's our goal to to get as much of it in working order at some point. That sounds kind of odd, but we have some really unique pieces that that are just one of a kind. We have a PRR dining car that would be just magnificent um, to have that restored. We have uh, an R50B uh, reefer car, refrigerator car that's in its condition, its complete form is one of a kind. There's a, a shell of an R50B reefer, uh, last I understood, and in, in around, but it was without its trucks or under undercarriage. So. The R50B reefer was a common scene uh, element on many express trains and, and passenger trains, and there's just one of them left. Uh, we have an X29 boxcar that was in express service. We have an N5 cabin car that's currently painted in the By War Bonds uh, paint scheme. And the centerpiece of our yard is the Queen Mary, a... Uh, the press center car that was built in 1952, utilizing four trucks from a T1, uh, from two T1 tenders, and uh, that's a unique piece. And today, that that provides entertainment for our largest fundraiser, our Live at Five concert series. So it's a little bit of adaptive reuse, but it's become our, it's become our actually our, our most successful uh, fundraiser at at the moment. So it's it's just really neat that we've incorporated our outdoor space into a community space uh, in the summertime. The largest building we have is our Harry Bennett Memorial Roundhouse. 
named for Harry Bennett, who was master mechanic of the Juniata locomotive shops um, in the 1920s. He was actually their first master mechanic. And under his supervision and leadership, the large majority of K-4 Pacifics were uh, built, including 1361, which is being restored in the Harry Bennett Memorial Roundhouse. The, the rolling stock, as you can tell, it's, it's unique. It's very uh, rare in a sense, and rare even in the sense of its, its unique history, where you might see several B-60s or several RPOs we have the only named RPO that was on the Broadway. That's our our collection at present. It is visually impressive even when you just go and see it outside of the events. But the fact that you're able to use it as a stage, I think is just an incredible blending of elements that you can use this to attract people who may not care about trains or railroading at all, but they want to go see a rock concert. And you have a lot of really cool acts that have come through over the years from what I've seen. Yeah. And we, we've had Foreigner out there and the B-52s, the name two of the biggest that I can recall. But, you know, it's it's amazing of how that series has made our museum relevant not so much in a in a history sense, but just an attractive site for for community goers who otherwise, as, you know, as you were alluding to, folks who may not be interested, local folks who would be interested in coming here, and uh, it's it's just really cool that we can get people in our door doors to support the museum. And one thing we're going to do is make sure that during the concerts that there's opportunity for pe- people to get involved with the museum and make sure that they're, they're aware of what we're doing and invite them to come back and tour the museum when we're open because uh, it's their history and it's their heritage. And I figure, Hey, it's a captive audience when they're inside the gates and why not? It's what we're about. And uh, you know, the, the, the people of Altoona, built the railroad and and we're here to honor their their contributions so we're, we're i hope that the locals who come out to our concerts can uh, can relate and and that's what it's all about is making our museum relatable to the everyday altoona uh, uh resident and local resident that have a connection to the prr and or all the way through norfolk southern what's the museum's involvement with horseshoe curve Going back, all the way back to the, the early days of the PRR in the late 1800s, the Horseshoe Curve has always been a worldwide known des- destination and tourist attraction. Um, originally called the Flower Garden because that's where uh, the railroad workers would would put in gardens because to beautify the area because it was just such a breathtaking view um, for railroad uh, passengers uh, when it opened in 1854. And later, at Catanning Point Station, uh, people would get off uh, off of passenger trains and walk around to the nature park and, and watch trains. There's YouTube videos of, of such things happening back in the 19, I believe 1920s, and it's really neat. All you have to do is YouTube, Horseshoe Curve, and all these videos come up. So you can see the popularity of it over the centuries, and it's still popular to this day. Uh, but... For those who remember the old experience, the prior to 1994 experience, there were stone steps, uneven steps. You would walk from the little gift shop, primitive gift shop at the bottom. You'd walk up this winding staircase of uneven stones with trees and overgrowth. (laughs) So it was very hard to access by everybody. So the museum was... Uh, looking at ways of getting involved and with a partnership with the National Park Service and again through through, uh, public funding uh, and a large part in fundraising, uh, the museum constructed the visitor center, the gift shop visitor center, the funicular, the incline that goes up the side of the hill, a new staircase and 
the museum was able to get ownership of the visitor center below, and then it's a uh, partnership with with the railroad for the the observation area up top. So it's it's a wonderful working relationship that we've been able to maintain uh, and to get people up there. And it's it's our it's our biggest attraction outside of the the museum. And uh, people just just love I love it. Everybody loves going there. It's so scenic, uh, and the engineering marvel behind it with J. Edgar Thompson and the Irish immigrants that helped construct that uh, wonderful uh, marvel, uh, there's, there's, again, a story to be told. And what, what you see is living proof of 1800s design and technology being implemented, and it's never been changed. When it was opened in 1854, the concept of that curve never changed. Yes, more tracks were added and one was removed later on, but the design remains the best proven method of getting over the Allegheny Bridge into, you know, drop, going up the mountain range, dropping into Johnstown and going down to Pittsburgh. So when you understand the terrain and you understand how why it was created, if you think of a of a screw, how it inclines wrapped around a cylinder, the horseshoe curve is much similar in that sense that it just, it wraps around going upgrade westward and it, you know, wraps around going down eastward and it's a gradual incline because if they were to build a bridge going, but spanning the two ridges, the, the grade would have been way, way too steep and way too impractical for, for anything to operate. So uh, Jager Thompson and his team sat down and or came out here, surveyed it, and developed that, that concept that's been in, in operation ever since. It's impressive to see how the design has stood the test of time and still matters to 21st century railroading. And to build upon that point, that's really our connection at present to modern day railroading because the curve, while it's it's themed and our, our site is themed in PRR, it's where we can connect our visitors to modern day railroading. And we're going to look at opportunities to, to come up with more educational uh, material for that uh, to get people involved because really it's the it's our best. It's our, it's our best tool to connect modern-day railroading with, with our visitors. Let's start with some of the questions that you guys submitted. First, from Ted Merrill, where can I buy one of those life-size K4 front ends that they have in the lobby? Sure. Well, <laughs> uh, you're going to have to write a grant or fundraise for that because uh, it, it was not a cheap installation. Uh, it was done by a professional firm, uh, exhibit firm that that came in and uh looked at blueprints and replicated each part individually so it's not something you can just walk in and buy or order you'd have to have something custom made based on uh drawings and diagrams speaking of k4 pacifics jason smirciak asks what is the status of pennsylvania railroad k4 number 1361 the K4 is really the crown jewel of the collection. It is the symbol of, of everything pure steam in my mind. Uh, the unique uh, design of it uh, came about because of scientific methods. Actually, this was one of the earliest examples of, of scientific development in terms of, de- of the development of steam locomotives. To understand the status of it today, you have to look backward. And really going back to 1904 with the uh, exhibition in Louisiana, the treadmill, the static treadmill was installed there for the first time by the PRR as a public exhibit. And at this exposition, the railroad brought in steam locomotives, they test them. They tested them out, draw power, output, everything. They were able to statically operate steam locomotives 
and record data and create a, a scientific baseline. From that came the development of the E6 class. From the E6 class came the K4. The K4 being the first, the K4 and the L1, the K4 being the passenger and the L1 class being the freight, utilizing the same boiler, utilizing a lot of the same data. And the difference being with the wheel arrangement, obviously with for freight purposes and one for passenger. Uh, and that was a part of the standardization of the standard railroad of the world. That could be attributed going back to Alexander J. Cassatt, the president of the PRR. He and Sam Ray led in an era of scientific development and and really the modern created the modern Pensy that we know today. Laid the foundation work. They built Penn Station. They utilized scientific methods and new technologies. They created the test department in 1906 here in Altoona, the one one of a kind. We are adjacent to the, the PRR testing facility that tested locomotives, metallurgy, light bulbs, everything you can imagine. They tested it right adjacent to the museum uh, where present-day Blair Medical and Associates are located. It encompassed about five acres and was the largest testing facility of its kind. From the testing departments, from the drafting boards, engineering departments, in the, sci in the test lab came the K-4. K-4-1361 was preserved in 1957 as a tribute to Altoona and placed atop Horseshoe Curve in 1957 as a tribute to the workers of the Pennsylvania Railroad and Altoona. In 1985, local leaders got together in partnership with the Railroad Museum to take the locomotive off the curve and put it on static display at the museum. At the time it was placed in static display at the museum, the local leaders got together again with the, and said, you know, we're not satisfied with leaving it a static display. In the 1980s, there was a real revival of steam locomotives in preservation and, and returning to operation. So K4 was not exempt from that. It was the last, really the last viable locomotive in preservation that was that was eligible to be restored after, of course, the 1222 and the 1223. This was the biggest example. And Altoona at that point you know, wanted to be put back on the map to to make it more relevant. So the the K4 was taken down to the Juniata shops and the old car shop building and disassembled and refurbished and put back together and was made operational for a short period of time. However, mechanical failures took place and sidelined the locomotive and through starts and stops it was there was restoration efforts. Uh, so I'll bore you that. You can go back and, and, and research the, the timeline of where it was prior to now. So the current status is it's being worked on by volunteers from the Juniata locomotive shops. And we're taking it one, one bolt at a time, one step at a time. And it's, we're doing it, we're trying to do it the right way. We have a group of people who want to see it restored, who want to help us out getting a momentum behind the project. And there will be a point in time where we will announce um, the full project scope. And I can just say that it's going to be a very exciting time for, for the museum and for the project. And we look forward to that day. Two years ago, when it was announced that Wick Mormon and Bennett Levin were involved in this restoration effort, there were comments from Bennett in particular suggesting that there was this vision for a touring educational train for which this engine would be the power. It, is that still the vision ultimately at this point? Oh, a absolutely, because it falls in line with our mission of the museum with education and preservation. And it's our collective goal is that the, that the K4 would be our living the living history component, where the museum is the interactive component. 
the horseshoe curve is the passive component and the K four would be the living component where there would be educational opportunities uh on site and uh and developing the program to where it could you know it would run and getting uh school children exposed to to their history firsthand. Um because there's just nothing like a living, breathing steam locomotive to stir up the all the excitement and and to get people involved. And the K four is is the spirit of Altoona. It has the the makings of 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 bringing to life so much in our community uh, from tourism perspective to to the educational perspective um, to opportunities that that are not realized yet. Uh, it it has a lot of potential, and and education is is the top of that list for potential. Andrew Dietrich asks, what recent projects has the museum been doing in the Roundhouse with the Horseshoe Curve chapter of the NRHS? The Curve chapter is is a vital uh, entity support group for the museum. In a way, it's a friends group. The chapter, as of recent, uh, has been helping out more with our archiving and our, our, museum, our, our museum projects versus Roundhouse projects. Uh, and, and that's really uh, where we're at with with projects. But of course, with COVID nineteen, um, <laughs> you know, I don't really have to elaborate on what that means. But you know, we're looking for future projects once we can get back to the state of normalcy with involvement, and we just have to proceed with caution. But uh, it's our friends group, it's a volunteer group, and we're always looking for for new volunteers uh, for the museum. The biggest thing is 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 getting younger people involved, and that that's our biggest uh, challenge. And we're not alone in that challenge. We really would love to have new people get involved with the museum and and take an active role in some of our projects, because you know it's railroading and some of it's labor intensive, and we need good strong backs to sometimes to, to get some of these big projects done. So. You know, if anybody's interested in volunteering, all you have to do is go on our website at railroadcity.com and look up our volunteer application process. We're recording this in July of 2020, and COVID-19 is very much on the forefront of people's minds right now. What does reopening at this point in time look like for you? Well, in June, we opened the Horseshoe Curve visitor center for weekends and that's friday through sunday 11 to 5. so right now in july we're looking at extending some hours up there expanding them and extending hours um, because it's been very popular so far and it's been a very cautious reopening Uh, we have all the social distancing literature all of the protocol in place for for everyone's safety What we are looking at now is reopening the railroad museum, which has been closed since, and it's it's been a very um, it's been a very delicate situation because the nature of CDC restrictions and the nature of our museum really don't mesh well with the the level of interactive exhibits, push buttons, and close proximity. So we we feel that as August comes around. We are looking to reopen with the appropriate guidelines, signage and literature and cleaning procedures. And it takes revenue to make revenue. And that's where we're at because of the delayed uh, opening across the board. Uh, we have to ease in as we ease in with our operation, we ease in with, with expenses as well. So it's all these approaches are financially based. And I will say we had to cancel our uh, our largest fundraiser our live at five series that's impacted us tremendously so it's caused the museum to go into survival mode in in many respects everything every action we take we have to look at the react the reactions and effects your museum is located right next to the norfolk southern main line and horseshoe curve itself is norfolk southern what is it 
like to have them as your neighbors? You mentioned that Conrail was helpful in moving pieces of equipment. What has been your relationship with Norfolk Southern? Well, my tenure at the museum is relatively new. I came on board in in February of this year as as the executive director. But thus far, the limited interactions I've had with, with the company has been very positive. We're respectful, I think, of one another. And I really am looking forward to working with Norfolk Southern because they are a huge asset to our community. And even with some of the the trends in their business model, which I, I won't, it's not my place to comment specifically on, on, on their decision making, but I, I will say I do see great opportunity uh, for the museum being adjacent to their main line for PR. And, and I really hope they, they seek us out and, and want to collaborate with us because, yes, we are a PRR everything at the museum, but we are the Railroaders Memorial Museum, not the Pennsylvania Railroaders Memorial Museum. History marches on. We are seeking opportunities to preserve the histories of Penn Central, Conrail, and Norfolk Southern, and employee relations and community relations go hand in hand, and I just think that the museum is such a wonderful venue that I, I hope that they seek us out to utilize their grounds for employee functions as they have done in the past. They have had barbecues and and luncheons and so on and so forth in their their yard for their employees. So I think it would just be a really wonderful venue for them. And we hope to get stories too. We hope to to document what's, what's going on with their operations and how trends change because even with precision railroading, I will say this, it's not a new concept at all. Even in our exhibit with Sam Ray that we have, it's all about, from corporate's perspective, it's about reduced cost and increased revenue. And and unfortunately, there are cause and effects of that. And, and I won't get into the current days, but furloughs and layoffs have always been part of the railroading culture. And it creates a lot of cause and effects with that and, and good and bad. And in our exhibit, you see that. You see the perspective of, of management where also in the same room, you see the reactions of labor and the unions and the importance of the unions and, and advocating for for fair wages and fair employers and, and fair uh, policies. There has always been a tug of war, so to speak, uh, you know, a, a give and take, and and it always pendulums back and forth. But technology has changed a lot, and that is more seen since the steam era with the invention of and implementation of the diesel electric locomotive, and going forward with computerization of of those locomotives and, and more modern, advanced technologies. I believe Norfolk Southern has a big role to play, and our doors are open. We want to work with them to tell their story so that future generations can come in and learn about what their parents are doing today. So it's all about relevancy. Last question I have for you, Joe. What do you love most about your work at the Railroaders Memorial Museum? I love everything about it, and I know that's, that sounds vague, but... Whether it's spending time in the archives, going through documents and blueprints or photographs, seeing equipment, seeing the old infrastructure, to interacting with our board members, to interacting with our local politicians as they advocate for for transportation and, and railroading uh, and informing them of, of the past. Because I feel I'm in a unique position to offer historical perspective to current issues and her maybe historical solutions to modern day issues. So it's really unique in that sense. To working in this community, uh, the Altoona community, I've, I've been working with for a number of years. Previous to my job here at the museum, I was executive director of the Ware County Historical Societies. I still feel like I'm a part of the family. I feel like I'm, I'm given new opportunities uh, with this museum. I, I look forward to, to the K-4, working with our volunteers and, and our committee behind the project, learning so much about it and why it's important 
and why it needs preserved and why it needs to operate again to to tackling infrastructure issues with their with their facilities to to looking at ways we can preserve our master mechanics building to ways of improving our horse and curve site the people the people that come through here uh our visitors i've never seen a more diverse crowd come through here we have people from from europe from from asia south america africa they come here because they love trains the most rewarding thing you can get is being able to connect with people you've never met before and see them light up when you talk about the museum and and light up about the the railroading with the horseshoe curve or the calls I get about the K4 and kids who want to see it run or retirees who remember it as when they were children and just a real desire to see their past, our collective past come, come to life and being able to be in a position to keep it preserved and, and hopefully do my part with the team to, to advance our, our, our cause. It's just such a humbling experience because when I started, I started at the museum when I was 15 years old, working maintenance, working the gift shop, working the archives, working part-time with, on top of a full-time job as executive director of the Historical Society as chief curator, and then given the opportunity to come full circle and become executive director is so rewarding because I really, I grew up with this museum and I came up through the ranks at every level. And knowing the place inside out, top to bottom, has, has been such an experience. And I hope that we can, we can do good and accomplish some things that we can't even imagine right now. So when you're asking me if, what I like about the job, I, I like the job. I like everything about it. You guys, if you haven't been there, you got to make a trip. Honestly, the whole Altoona corridor, there's so much to see, but your museum is a key part of that, as is Horseshoe Curve. Thank you for joining us here on the podcast to talk about the museum and what your goals are for the future. It sounds like you have some really good stuff going on and wishing you the best of luck as you go forward. Thank you, Nick, and I hope that we can touch base in the near future and talk about some of our new and upcoming uh, projects. Excellent idea. And now, the question of the day. Your question of the day for this episode is, what do you love most about the history of railroading in Pennsylvania? Let me know on the roundhousepodcast.com. We have links to social media there. So close to episode number 100. Thank you guys for tuning in, supporting the show. And remember, as always, that the Roundhouse is our house.